and welcome to part 1 of this e-module on heating, ventilation and air conditioning, HVAC. HVAC systems will be covered in a total of 4 modules where we will learn about the different systems that are a part of HVAC. This is the first module of the series which will focus on air conditioning systems. In addition, it will cover the basics of HVAC systems. Let's take a look at the learning objectives of this module. By the end of this module, you will be able to Describe the HVAC system Classify the HVAC systems Understand air conditioning and why we require it Explain the working principle of an air conditioning system Discuss the components of a simple air conditioning system Describe the various types of air conditioning units List the different types of cooling. Name the original equipment manufacturers, that is OEMs. List the maintenance checklist of split or window ACs. Explain the impact on business. Explain the common issues associated with air conditioning systems. Let us begin with the introduction to HVAC systems. What do we mean by HVAC systems and why are they so important to us? Let's take a look. One of the major systems in a modern office building is HVAC, that is heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems are used in a facility to provide a consistent conditioned environment by maintaining temperature, humidity and air quality for the comfort of occupants as also for optimal performance of equipment. The combined system will heat or cool the air as required, distribute the conditioned air, introduce fresh air inside the building, remove odour, CO2 and maintain temperature or humidity inside the facility. Thus, the HVAC system plays a major role in controlling the indoor air quality which can affect the productivity as well as the health of the building occupants. HVAC systems are used in medium to large industrial and office buildings where safe and healthy building conditions need to be regulated with respect to temperature and humidity using fresh air from outdoors. The HVAC system also has a great implication on the facility utility bills and occupant satisfaction considering that it consumes a large part of the utility electric supply, typically 35-40% to 40 and bad order, hot or cold calls that is request or complaints from about 50% of the total calls received at the facility help desk. We have learned that HVAC systems constitute of heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems. Now, let us see how these systems are used within the facilities. Depending on the climatic conditions, the heating and air conditioning systems may be separate systems or may be conjoined to provide heating or cooling as required. The advantage of having a combined system is that some components like the ductwork or heat exchangers can be used for both heating and cooling. Though we will learn about the components of HVAC later, note that the HVAC systems can be broadly classified into split systems, Example being split ACs where one unit is inside and one is outside and packaged systems. Example, window ACs, single unit. Now, let's take a look at these systems each individually. Let's start with split systems. Split systems are the most classic of the heating and air conditioning systems. These are systems where you have components of the whole system that are both inside and outside the building. HVAC split systems will typically have air conditioners that cool refrigerant to create a chilling effect and gas furnaces to generate heat. In either system, ducts circulate the air throughout the indoor area, which is a process that is aided by the presence of evaporator coils or fan coils within the unit. The systems can be controlled by using thermostats throughout the facility to adjust the temperature. Let's now understand what packaged systems are. Packaged systems are a great option for areas that do not have the space to accommodate split systems. Unlike split systems, reliance on two units, 
package systems involve only a single unit. This unit is an air conditioner or heat pump that is merged with an evaporator coil or fan coil. The compact nature of a packaged system is an appealing alternative for people that need to heat or cool a small space. Now that you have an understanding of what HVAC systems are, let's take a closer look at each element of the HVAC systems individually, namely heating systems, ventilation systems, air conditioning or cooling systems in greater detail. Let's start with heating. The H in HVAC stands for heating. It refers to the process of maintaining optimal temperature for human comfort in cold conditions or environment. In smaller spaces, such as houses and rooms, electric heaters and hot air blowers are used for heating. However, larger places require a central heating plant. The heating process comprises of generation of heat and its distribution in the facility. Since India is a tropical country, there may not be many facilities where heating systems run through the year. A typical central heating system will have three basic parts. The heating plant, where fuel is converted into useful heat. A distribution system comprising pipes or ducts to deliver heat to various spaces. Controls to regulate the system. In a central heating system, heat source may be a furnace, a boiler or a heat pump. Furnace a furnace is a device to generate heat and comprises of an enclosed structure in which material can be heated to a very high temperatures. Heat may be generated by burning fuel like natural gas, propane and fuel oil or by electricity to produce heat. This heat is transferred to air which is then circulated via a fan and ducts to provide warm air to the spaces served. Boilers a furnace, where distribution of heat is done via water or steam, is commonly known as a boiler. Here, instead of a fan and duct system, a pump is used to circulate hot water through pipes to radiators. The hot water gives up its heat in a radiator, which in turn heats up the air blowing over it. The cooler water returns to the boiler for reheating. Besides the specific purpose of conditioning air, Boilers and furnaces may be used for other industrial applications requiring hot water, steam and manufacturing. Heat pump A heat pump is a device that moves heat energy from one place to the other. It is very much like an air conditioner or a refrigerator with the advantage that it can reverse direction of flow thus enabling it to condition air in both cold and warm days. In cooler days, it removes heat from outside and transfers it inside and vice versa on warmer days. For climates with moderate heating and cooling needs, heat pumps offer an energy-efficient alternative to furnaces and air conditioners. Let's now take a look at ventilation systems. The V in HVAC stands for ventilating or ventilation. It is the process of exchanging or replacing air in a given space to provide high indoor air quality. It involves temperature control, oxygen replenishment and removal of moisture, odors, smoke, heat, dust, airborne bacteria, carbon dioxide and other gases. Ventilation removes unpleasant smells and excessive moisture, introduces outside air, keeps interior building air circulating and prevents stagnation of the interior air. The ventilation systems are covered in greater detail in HVAC Part 3 module. Lastly, let's look at air conditioning systems. AC is the abbreviation for air conditioning systems. This module and the next one, Part 1 and 2, will cover the air conditioning systems and cooling systems in detail, which include the various types of air conditioners, chillers, chilled water pumps, cooling towers, etc., the working principles, uses and the operations and maintenance aspects of these systems. Let us now understand what air conditioning means. Air conditioning can be defined as a system for controlling the humidity, ventilation and temperature in a building, typically to maintain a cool atmosphere in warm conditions. The air conditioning 
the refrigeration cycle process removes heat and moisture from a building where it is not wanted and transfers that heat to an area external to the building. The air conditioner itself does not create heat. It just transfers heat employing the laws of thermodynamics. It not only maintains the temperature but also maintains suitable humidity in all parts of a building resulting in a comfortable environment. When humidity is high, the air conditioning systems have to work harder to keep the facility cool. A complete air conditioning system will cater to maintenance of temperature or humidity and distribution and filtration of conditioned air. Now that you have understood what air conditioning systems are, let us understand why exactly we need them. Human comfort with respect to quality of indoor air depends on the temperature, humidity and the cleanliness of the air which in turn are impacted by internal and external factors. Conditioning of air is required to ensure that these parameters remain within the limits of acceptability for human comfort. In addition to meeting the requirement of human comfort, the air conditioning is also required to cater for some equipment used inside the facilities, typically electronic equipment that need lower temperatures to operate. The air conditioning system also helps in maintaining the CO2 levels by taking adequate fresh air into the area being cooled. Some of these systems use additional filtration techniques to clean the air. In some cases, Humidifiers or dehumidifiers are also used as required. Next, we will look at the factors that affect the quality of indoor air. Some factors that impact the air within a building are the sun, electrical and electronic appliances and human beings. The sun. Sun is the major cause of rise in ambient temperature which in turns heats up the walls of a building and hence the indoor air. The ambient temperature varies through the day and may reach up to very high temperatures depending on the geographical location and the time of the day. Electrical and Electronic Appliances Electrical and electronic appliances like computers, printers or fax machines, tube lights, lamps, coffee maker, kitchen equipment etc. are a necessity in a modern day facility. All these equipment also generate heat which contributes to higher indoor air temperature. These also play an important role in generation of heat inside the room. Human beings. The body of human beings also generates heat which can increase the temperature inside the room. Thus, as the number of human beings inside the room increase, the total heat generated by the human beings also increases. Perspiration also adds to the humidity in the air. The exhaling action of humans increases the amount of carbon dioxide in the air and the same also needs to be controlled within permissible limits. According to a research, the conducive conditions of indoor air for human comfort are a temperature of around 24-25 degrees Celsius, a relative humidity of 40% to 70% and sufficient flow of clean air with CO2 levels below 900 ppm. In order to control these parameters and maintain the quality of indoor air, we need air conditioning systems. The air conditioning system removes all the heat that is generated inside the room and maintains the temperature. It also removes the excess amount of moisture from the air and maintains relative humidity of the indoor air. The air conditioning system distributes the conditioned air within facility and is also designed to take adequate fresh air into the area being cooled, thus maintaining the CO2 levels as well. The system may use additional filtration techniques to clean the air and in some cases humidifiers or dehumidifiers as required. You must now be wondering how air conditioning systems work. Let's have a look. Air conditioning systems work on the premise of the two laws of thermodynamics. Let's begin with the first law. The first law of thermodynamics, also known as law of conservation of energy, states that heat is a form of energy 
and thermodynamic processes are therefore subject to the principle of conservation of energy. This means that heat energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can, however, be transferred from one location to another and converted to and from other forms of energy. This can also be expressed as any change in the internal energy of a system is given by the sum of the heat that flows across its boundaries and the work done on the system by the surroundings. In the given example, as more and more heat is being transferred to the kettle, the temperature of the liquid inside the kettle goes up. Let's now learn about the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is about the quality of energy. It implies that as energy is transferred or transformed, more and more of it is wasted. The second law helps us understand the basic refrigeration cycle. It is not possible for heat to flow from a colder body to a warmer body without any process taking place. Energy will not flow spontaneously from a low temperature object to a higher temperature object. This precludes a perfect refrigerator. The statements about refrigerators apply to air conditioners and heat pumps, which embody the same principles. Next, let's understand the working of an air conditioning system with the help of an example. A typical air conditioning system will cool a medium which could be air, water or gas and then push it around these spaces to be cooled for heat exchange to take place. The interaction of the hot air and the cold medium enable heat exchange. That is, hot air will become cooler and cooling medium will become hotter, thus taking the heat away from the area being cooled. In the example shown, a cold liquid is passed over an apple which is to be cooled. Due to the temperature difference, the apple loses heat to the refrigerant liquid. The refrigerant in turn is heated due to heat absorption from the apple. Now that we have understood the working principle of air conditioning systems, let's learn about the different types of cooling. There are many ways to achieve cooling, including magnetic, thermoelectric, vortex, etc. But we will restrict ourselves to the ones more prominently used in facilities, which include free cooling, evaporative cooling and mechanical cooling. Now let's look at these cooling systems individually. Let's start with free cooling. In cooler climates, low external temperatures are used to chill a coolant, which in turn can be used to cool the inside air. A pump is used to circulate the coolant, which may be water or glycol, from a cold source to the area to be cooled. In some cases, the chilled coolant may also be stored to provide cooling in warmer times. Next, we will learn about evaporative cooling. In very dry climates, evaporative coolers may be used to provide cooling indoors. In these systems, the outside air is drawn inside through a wet pad. As the dry hot air passes through the water, some of the water is evaporated thus not only cooling the air but also increasing the moisture content of the air inside. It should be noted that these systems are ineffective where the humidity in outside air is already at high levels. The last type of cooling that we are going to cover in this section is mechanical cooling. Mechanical cooling is the lowering of temperature within a space using refrigerant compressors, absorbers or other systems that require energy from depletable sources and mechanical work to be done in order to condition the space. Since the process employed is cyclic in nature, let us understand the two basic cycles that are employed in the air conditioning systems. Most air conditioning systems use the vapor compression cycle for cooling. Let's understand how this cycle works with the help of this animation. In this cycle, a refrigerant enters the compressor in the vapor form where it is compressed. The high pressure and the high temperature vapor from the compressor is taken to a condenser or the heat exchanger where it loses its heat to the outside environment and turns back into the liquid phase. The low temperature liquid is then set to an expansion valve where the pressure decreases abruptly causing evaporation of part of the liquid and thus cooling it. 
The expansion valve, also known as a metering unit or throttling unit, also regulates the flow of liquid into the evaporator. The mixture of coal liquid and vapor is then sent to the evaporator where the remaining liquid also evaporates, absorbing the heat from the warm air around it, cooling it in the process. Thereafter, the cycle repeats itself. Thus, heat is absorbed from the cool environment, that is evaporator, and taken or released to the outside environment, that is condenser. You must be wondering what refrigerants are. Let's have a look. A refrigerant is a substance, mostly a fluid, used in a refrigeration cycle to cool a space. The refrigerant changes its phase from liquid to gas and back to liquid during each cycle, thus enabling the heat transfer that is important for the refrigeration purposes. Many refrigerants have been used in the past, the more common ones being CFC and HCFC. R12 and R22. However, both these types have an ozone depleting potential and hence, as per Indian government's plan, CFCs and HCFCs will be phased out from India by the year 2030. The most environment friendly refrigerants that are available in Indian market currently are R290 and R600A. They are HC or hydrocarbons and their chemical names are propane for R290 and isobutane for R600A. They are completely halogen-free, have no ozone depletion potential and are lowest in terms of global warming potential. They also have high energy efficiency but are highly flammable as they are hydrocarbons. Now we will look at the vapor absorption cycle, which is another type of cycle employed in air conditioning systems. Let's understand the working of this cycle with the help of an animation. The vapor absorption cycle is similar to the vapor compression cycle. However, the method of raising the pressure of vapor differs. The compressor of the compression cycle is replaced by an absorber, pump and a generator. The absorber is used for dissolving the refrigerant into a suitable liquid. The pump raises the pressure of the liquid and the generator uses heat to separate the refrigerant from the high pressure liquid. There are three stages involved in this process evaporation, absorption and regeneration. During evaporation, a liquid refrigerant evaporates in a low partial pressure environment, thus extracting heat from its surroundings. During absorption, the gaseous refrigerant is absorbed by another liquid such as a salt solution. During regeneration, the refrigerant saturated liquid is heated, causing the refrigerant to evaporate. The hot gaseous refrigerant passes through a heat exchanger, transferring its heat outside the system and condenses. The condensed refrigerant supplies the evaporation phase. The vapor absorption cycle systems have a very low coefficient of performance, that is efficiency, and are predominantly used only where waste heat is readily available than electricity. As indicated earlier, most air conditioning systems employ the vapor compression cycle, including the window and split air conditioners that we use at our homes. Let us now discuss the primary components of a simple window or split air conditioner. The first component that we are going to discuss is compressor. A compressor is a device that compresses gas, thus reducing its volume and increasing its pressure. In an air conditioning system, the compressor draws the low pressure gas from the evaporator and compresses it to a high temperature before supplying it to the condenser. Compressors used in air conditioning systems may be classified into reciprocating, centrifugal, rotary, screw and scroll compressors. You will learn more about these in greater detail in HVAC part 2. However, window and split ACs usually have a reciprocating or rotary types of compressors. Next, we are going to learn about condensers. A condenser is a device that is used to convert a substance from its gaseous state to liquid state. In this process, 
Heat is transferred from the substance to its surrounding medium or a condenser coolant, which may be air or water. Air cool condensers may be natural convection or forced air convection. In both these systems, air flows over the condenser tubes, cooling the refrigerant inside. In a water cool condenser, cold water is used to take away the heat from the refrigerant. The construction of the condensers may be different double tube or shell tube. The water cool condensers require a cooling tower to take away the heat from the water and then resupply it for condenser cooling. Water cool condensers will normally require lesser space and are more difficult to maintain. They are used for large conditioning plants serving large cooling loads. Evaporative condensers are also available, but they are less frequently used as they are comparatively less efficient. The next component that we are going to learn about is the expansion valve. Expansion valves are flow restricting devices that reduce the pressure of the fluid passing through them. As we learned before, the condenser allows the refrigerant to cool, but the refrigerant comes out at the same pressure. The expansion valve ensures a constant supply of refrigerant to the evaporator depending on how quickly the refrigerant turns into gaseous state without superheating. The flow restriction in the expansion wall reduces pressure of the refrigerant to allow for expansion back into the gaseous state. It does so by means of a combination of a movable pin and spring. The temperature at the outlet of evaporator and pressure of the evaporator are used as the controlling factors. Higher temperatures cause more fluid to flow into the evaporator. Another component used in the refrigeration cycle is the evaporator, where the liquid refrigerant is converted back into the gaseous from thereby absorbing heat and cooling the surrounding media, indoor air in smaller systems and water in larger systems. In smaller systems, like window ACs, evaporators may also be known as cooling coils. In larger systems, where they cool the water, they may be known as chillers. In smaller systems, evaporators can be made up of bare tube, plate surface or finned. The air flows directly over the surface and is cooled by the refrigerant passing through the tubes. Plates and fins are added to increase the area of contact. The larger systems like chillers are made up of shell and tube and they can be classified as dry expansion where refrigerant flows on tube side while the water flows on the shell. Flooded type where the refrigerant level is maintained in the shell and water flows through the tubes. The last component of air conditioning systems that we are going to learn about is thermostat. A thermostat is used in air conditioners for feedback and to maintain the desired temperature in the area to be conditioned. It senses the temperature and switches on or off the cooling and heating systems at set points. Thermostats may be mechanical or bimetal, electrical or electronic or thermistors. Now that we have learned about the basic components and working principle of an air conditioning system, let us look at the different types of units used in facilities. These systems include windows air conditioners, split type units, packaged ductible systems, central plants and variable refrigerant flow or volume that is VRF or VRV. Now let us learn more about each one of them. Let's begin with the most basic type of air conditioners which are known as window air conditioners. These are simple domestic air conditioners which can be fitted into an opening in the wall or window and may be in use in facilities where other systems are not possible to be installed. In this type of unit, all the components are installed within a compact unit. A fan is used to blow air over the evaporator coils and then directly into the room. Filters may be added on the return side to prevent dust from entering into the system. The next most commonly used air conditioning systems are split type units. These units are divided into two parts, an outdoor unit and an indoor unit. The outdoor unit comprises all components of the unit except the evaporator. The evaporator is placed inside the room to be cooled. 
split ACs require extra length of refrigerant tubes to connect the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. However, they are preferred over window AC because they offer lesser noise and vibrations. Split units are suitable for smaller rooms and two or more units can be deployed to offer rotation as well as redundancy. It is also useful to have these units installed as a backup for chiller cooled systems in facilities where the use of chiller can be reduced if only few critical areas need to be served in the off hours. This can save a lot of chiller running time and hence reduce utility bills. Another type of air conditioning systems used in facilities are packaged ductible systems. These systems are similar to window ACs in design because all the components are installed in a single unit. However, these are comparatively larger and installed outdoors. Cool air is pushed into the area to be cooled with the help of a fan forcing the air through ducts opening into the facility. In cooler environments, a heating system may also be integrated into the package unit, thus obviating the need to have a separate heating system in cold weathers. Packaged ductible systems will be covered in greater detail in HVAC Part 4 module. Let us now learn about central plants. In modern facilities, where the cooling load is very high, a conventional central package unit requires a large amount of refrigerant to be circulated through a maze of pipes to provide the cooling. To overcome this issue, central plants are used to cool water or a water solution. This is then circulated through pipes and heat exchangers, typically AHUs, to cool the air. These types of central systems are also called chillers. These systems require additional equipment for pumping and recirculating the water in the central plant. Primary and secondary pumps are installed for pumping water into and out of the system and an expansion tank may be added to prevent hammering in the pipes. Chillers will be covered in greater detail in HVAC Part 2 module. The last type of air conditioning unit that we are going to learn about is variable refrigerant flow or volume that is VRF or VRV. VRVs are variants of a split ACs. The difference being that VRVs use a multi-split configuration that is serve multiple indoor units in different zones and control the volume of flow of refrigerant to each indoor unit to maintain the temperature in that zone. The units can be designed so as to cool one zone while heating another. This technology was originally developed by Daikin in Japan and called VRV. Other manufacturers of VRVs use the term VRF. In addition to the flexibility of individual zone control, VRVs have certain other advantages like higher efficiencies, tighter control on zone temperature, modular design, scalability by way of adding indoor units if capacity exists in the outdoor unit. The indoor units used could be any type, such as FCUs, ceiling-mounted cassette, floor-standing units or high-wall units. We will learn VRVs in greater detail in HVAC Module 4. Do you know who the top manufacturers of air conditioning systems are? Let's have a look. The top 5 manufacturers of window and split air conditioning units are Daikin, Carrier, LG, Blue Star, Voltas. All ACs, whether split or window, require continuous maintenance for proper functioning. Here is the list of daily and quarterly maintenance schedule that you need to follow. Daily. Inspect the units visually. Check the units for proper cooling. Check for abnormal sounds or foul odor in the room. Quarterly. Check for abnormal noise, vibration and smell during operation. Inspect proper working of all operating controls, safeties and electrical starters. For bell-driven components, check tension of belt. Check condition of capacitors. Check motors, windings, insulation and lubricate bearings. 
record current drawn by motors and compressors. Tighten all electrical terminations. Clean filters and ensure that the condensate drain is clear. Clean control panel with blower. Clean condenser and evaporator coils as required. Dirty condenser coils raise refrigerant pressure higher than needed, increasing electric bill. Check refrigerant charge. A low or high refrigerant charge can easily go unnoticed. Gas leaks are one of the most common reasons for insufficient cooling. Charge gas as required. Check thermostats. Improperly calibrated thermostats cause the unit to run longer than necessary. Every degree your air conditioner operates below 78 degrees can add 5 to 8 percent to the cost of cooling. It is also important to understand the impact of air conditioners on businesses. Let's discuss. Split and window ACs are usually deployed in facilities where the central AC duct cannot be provided. Improper functioning of these ACs can impact businesses in several ways. Let's see how. In locations where there's no other AC available, it is obvious that if any failure is there, the cooling in that room will be impacted. Being smaller units, the impact will generally be local. But if it is an equipment room like a server room, battery room or switch room, the heat generated by the equipment will need to be removed by some other means. Normally, for critical areas like electrical rooms, more than one machine is deployed for ensuring backup towards continued operations. This is the last topic of this module in which we will look at the top air conditioning issues that you may encounter and some troubleshooting tips to address those issues. The first issue could be that your unit does not run. To address this issue, you need to check if the power supply is available, check the breaker if it is on, check the power outlet socket or switch. If there is a sign of burning, you may need to replace the outlet. In some ACs, operation of safety will prevent it from starting again. In such cases, you need to switch off the supply to AC and restart after some time. Inadequate cooling could be another issue you might encounter. In this case, you need to check the setting of the thermostat. It may be too high. Check the filters. They might be dirty. Clean the condenser and evaporator coils. Dirty coils prevent proper heat exchange. Ensure that there's no leakage in the refrigerant line and the compressor is not faulty as they reduce the cooling effect too. The leakage needs to be rectified before charging the gas in the unit. Another possible reason may be very high ambient temperature or leakage of outside air into the room. Ensure that the rear side of the window AC or the outdoor unit of split AC is not blocked with plants or any other items. Next issue could be that your unit switches on and off quite frequently. This could be because the temperature setting is too close to the ambient. Dirty coils and filters can also lead to the unit switching frequently. In such cases, you need to adjust the temperature settings, clean filters and coils regularly. At times, you may notice water dripping from AC. The condensate gets collected at the bottom plate of the casing and the AC needs to be installed so that the slope is towards the drain plug in the unit. Correct orientation as required. Another issue could be that your compressor or fans do not turn on. Mostly, this happens due to failed capacitors and replacing them would take care of the issue. Sometimes, the compressor motor does get grounded or fails and in such cases, there is no option but to replace the compressor. At times, the circuit breaker might be tripping or fuse might be blowing frequently. This generally happens due to overload. Short circuits within the unit can also cause the breakers to trip or fuses to blow. Check if the circuit is connected to other electrical loads and reduce load if the total load exceeds the capacity of the breaker. That brings us to the end of part 1 of this module on HVAC. 
In this module, we looked at HVAC systems and their types. We then learned about air conditioners, their working principle and components. We also got to know about the types of cooling and the different types of air conditioning units.